Thank you for Thank joining us. The program will begin shortly. Welcome to From Physical Plant to Mental Health. What's the best use for American Rescue Plan Education Funds? Presented by the USC Rossier School of Education. Before we begin, I would like to review the process for submitting questions. Please start submitting your questions by asking them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We will use these questions and the ones submitted in advance to facilitate today's discussion. We hope to get to as many as possible. Closed captioning is available for this event. Please use the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen to access it. Lastly, please note a recording of this webinar will be available after the event. Now, please welcome the Emory Stoops and Joyce King Stoops, Dean of the USC Rossier School of Education, Pedro Noguera, and California State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tony Thurmond. Good afternoon and uh, welcome. It's my pleasure to start us off by introducing our state superintendent, uh, Tony Thurmond, uh, who has been on the front lines of providing leadership to our schools throughout the state during this critical period. Uh, Superintendent Thurmond, I'd like to say a few words. Dr. Nagara, thank you. And thank you for uh, really helping to lead a wonderful movement of partners in higher education who are sharing stories and research and best practices about how to help our K-12 schools to, uh, in their efforts to reopen for in-person instruction uh, and how to stay open. Thank you for the series. Excited to hear from Dr. Zadelman and Morgan Polikoff and uh, Dr. Julie Moss and others and a great lineup of superintendents uh, that you have organized. Um, this is definitely the toughest time that we've all experienced in our lifetime, uh, but together we can get through. And um, you know the state has provided resources, the CARES Act and the federal government have provided resources. And that means that we've got to accelerate the use of vaccines, rapid COVID tests, ventilation for our schools, and of course, mental health resources to support our students. So I'm excited for the conversation, Dr. Nagara. Thank you for your leadership and for the series uh, and helping uh, our K-12 schools to be able to safely open and stay open for in-person instruction. Thank you. And, and Superintendent, uh, once again, it was your idea that we do something specifically at super, uh, aimed at other superintendents, something interactive. Uh, now, we, I know there'll be others as well on the webinar today, but just in your opinion, what do you see as some of the unique challenges facing our superintendents right now? Yeah, I just want to acknowledge um, our superintendents and their leadership that, you know, we are at a place, let's face it, there's no playbook. Uh, for how to deal with the pandemic. Most of us have not dealt with this, and this is the toughest experience that most of us will have in our lifetime. So superintendents have had to be out front and trying to answer questions where there aren't always answers. And so uh, my heart goes out to them, and I'm grateful for their leadership and for educators, parents and students. Everyone has demonstrated 
resilience. But even so, these are very tough times. We see uh, people who are frustrated, they're anxious. Uh, our students have experienced all kinds of depression and other challenges. And so uh, I, I have great care and appreciation for our, our superintendents. And, um, you know, we, we have a bounty of riches. We have a wonderful community, higher education community in California. And that allows us to tap into research that helps us to figure out answers uh, to many of the questions. And I wanna, uh, again, uh, thank you, Dr. Naguera, for agreeing to be a, a liaison, if you will, uh, between our higher education community and what we do in the K-12 community. Thank you for saying yes to that uh, for today's webinar. Uh, you know, and for earlier this week, when we had one of your colleagues on, uh, who has done some research on uh, the use of rapid COVID tests, uh, groundbreaking research out of, the, out of, out of uh, USC that we can now present to our districts and families to make a uh, decision. So thank you to you and thank you to our superintendents. Hang in there. Uh, we know that 9,000 of our schools, uh, 9,000 out of 10,000 schools are either open or getting close to being open in person. And a lot of that is uh, due to the availability of research and best practices uh, coming out of our higher education community. So thank you, Dr. McGarrett. Well, thank you. And I hope that this is just the, what we'll see a lot more of, of in terms of cooperation between higher ed and our, our public school system. So appreciate your support for this event today. I think we need it, especially as you have throughout your career talked about the importance of closing the opportunity gap. Um, I think we've all worked on these gaps, but we've seen how they've been accelerated during the pandemic. I'm just grateful, as you said, for this partnership in our higher education and K-12 community. One, I, I just think that we have access to best practices for how to help close that opportunity gap. And two, through that collaboration, when we're in better times, I hope we can just really prioritize how we help our students um, get access to higher education? How do we create a better pipeline between K-12 and higher education so that all of our students can enjoy uh, the, the opportunity um, to, to get, um, I, I was gonna say a college degree, but I'd say a college degree and a master's degree and a doctorate degree and a medical degree. We want them to get them all. We want them to have full access. So thank you, sir. Thank you. So on that point of opportunity, one of the opportunities that we're gonna really focus on today is the opportunity created by all the public funds that are now available to schools and how to best utilize those. So we're gonna start with our faculty panel and if I could get help uh, introducing our panelists. Today we have three faculty panelists joining us. The first is Howard Edelman, professor of psychology and co-director of the School Mental Health Project at UCLA. Our second faculty panelist, is Julie A. Marsh, Professor of Education Policy and Faculty Director for Policy Analysis for California Education at the USC Rossier School of Education. Our third faculty panelist is Morgan Polikoff, Associate Professor of Education at the USC Rossier School of Education. We are also joined today by three superintendent panelists. The first is Darren Brawley, superintendent of Compton Unified School District. Our second superintendent panelist is Roxanne Fuentes, superintendent for Berryessa Union School District. And our third superintendent panelist is Sandra Lyon, superintendent for Palm Springs Unified School District. Howard, I think we'll start with you. Okay, I'll get going here. When they told me I'd have about three minutes to talk with you today, I thought, as I usually do, it takes me that long to clear my throat. I'm not sure I'll get through it. I wanna use my three minutes to focus on what schools need to do differently to address the increased number of students experiencing emotional behavior and learning problems and the overwhelming number who must be re-engaged with their schooling. Given that everyone has indicated that mental health concerns are a priority, significant COVID-19 relief funds will be used to help students, families, and staff with respect to their concerns. But we need to go further. One of the things that worries me from a historical standpoint is that if history repeats itself, the trend will be to use the current funds and the COVID money primarily just to add a few more personnel and implement yet one or two more ad hoc initiatives. The problem with that is that schools already have had more students in need than they could help. They've always had that. 
and more of the same is not going to do the answer, provide the answer we need right now. At this time, it's essential that schools do much more than pursue old ideas in addressing the many multifaceted and overlapping barriers to learning and teaching that confront students and staff. Now is the time to start a bold and innovative process for transforming student and learning supports to better address a broad range of barriers to learning and teaching and enhance equity of opportunity. In doing so, schools not only can play a significant role in addressing the mental health problems of some students, but they also can develop a unified, comprehensive and equitable system of supports for all students and especially those experiencing emotional behavioral learning problems. It also can do more for families and school staff. In some as plans are made to meet the elevated priority to address mental health concerns and promote social emotional learning and development, it's time to move in new directions. Temporary increases in funding provide a way to do much more than meet the demands of the immediate needs of students and staff. They provide a special opportunity to initiate the transformation of student and learning supports to better address barriers to learning and teaching and re-engage the many students who have become disengaged. And when the temporary funds disappear as they inevitably will, the transformation can be sustained by redeploying regularly allocated funds for student and learning supports and weaving in whatever community resources are available to fill gaps. Our work with schools across the country suggests that moving in such a new direction is critical for directly addressing both the achievement and the opportunity gaps. Our research has developed a prototype for a unified, comprehensive, and equitable system of learning supports. A recent overview has been provided in a policy analysis from PACE. They entitled it Restructuring California Schools to Address Barriers to Learning and Teaching in the COVID-19 Context and Beyond that and several other resources that will help with immediate needs as well as thinking about moving forward. Uh, the URLs for those will be put on your chat. They're all available for free on our website. So thanks for letting me take a, these few minutes and I hope that we'll get a chance to work with you some in the future. Thank you, Howard. And Julie, if you go next. Great, yeah, thank you. I think I might be echoing a couple of Howard's ideas here, but I, I wanted to frame a couple challenges I see in this conversation and then some thoughts on how we might frame it. And I think one of the big challenges is that these are one-time funds, as Howard said, but the needs are recurring and we won't solve these really quickly. So I think we need to think about questions of sustainability and long-term impact. I think another challenge pertains to process. I think some of us may be drawn to look for evidence-based strategies and practices and I think if we did that, ultimately, we're not going to address the needs that we need to, and we might not be surfacing new opportunities. I really like the words, Nora Gordon is a professor at Georgetown, and she said in a piece I read the other day, leading with the answers instead of the questions can mean the best options never even get considered. And I think a final concern is that if we feed more resources into the same system, we won't fundamentally change the experiences and outcomes for kids. And so we do need to be thinking about different uses of resources, again, to echo Howard's points. Um, and as we approach this question then of how we should be using this, this, all of these funds that are coming into districts, I'd urge us to think very strategically, but also with the transformative view of equity at the center. I think that there are students who have really never been served well by our system and that the pandemics have only exacerbated that. And we have an obligation, I think, both to shower them with more support and resources uh, that they deserve and need. And I think that's more in the sort of conception of, sort of a liberal democratic conception of equity. But we also owe it to them to rethink and redesign systems and structures so that we can better serve kids um, and particularly those most impacted by COVID and systemic racism. And I think Howard was alluding to, there's a report that I, my colleagues and I at PACE and other organizations like Ed Trust West and Californians for Justice have been working on this report coming out next week and a set of tools and and I think it's useful because it's all framed around the idea of what a, of, of creating a restorative restart to school. So redesigning schools to be restorative places, right? Places where students feel safe, supported, known, and fully engaged in their learning, and where the social and emotional well-being of all the adults in these school buildings are really nurtured. 
And this work has to happen over the summer and then has to start happening throughout the year and it has to be expanded. And we talk about five different areas that we need to focus on, centering relationships between families, students and educators, addressing whole child needs, strengthening staffing and community-based partnerships to address the learning and mental health needs that Howard was talking about, making teaching and learning relevant and rigorous. And I think in that we need to prioritize racial equity and then laying the groundwork for systemic transformation really has to happen through teams and some visioning activities. I think once we agree on those priorities and what specifically makes sense in each of our communities, then I think we can consider what are the resources that we need to make that happen? What's the time, the talent, the training, the materials that has to go into that? So I'm happy to share more details as our conversation goes on and I, we can put the link to the PACE website where that report will be released next Thursday. I think at its core, those ideas might not be groundbreaking, but our hope is that these will be actionable with some very specific links and examples of things that we might be doing in these areas. And I thank you and I, I look forward to our conversation today. Thank you, Julie. Um, Morgan. All right, thank you very much. So um, I've been a part of a team that's been studying the longitudinal impact of the pandemic on families and kids through the Understanding America study. And uh, we've uncovered the disparate impacts of the pandemic along multiple axes of inequality. And where we see the biggest gaps are actually in terms of income, but we also do see gaps based on race, ethnicity, uh, partisanship, you know, whether places are uh, more democratic or Republican. Um, location, both within and across states in terms of urbanicity, and also grade level, of course, with uh, elementary versus secondary. And based on what I've seen, I have uh, three specific recommendations. Of course, I would also echo everything that was previously said, but luckily my pre-existing recommendations don't overlap too much. So the first thing is I think we need to do absolutely everything possible to get kids back in person in, at minimum, as close to a normal schedule as possible. So this probably means figuring out what's driving hesitancy locally and working to address it. Um, is it teacher vaccination? Is it vaccination rates in the community? Is it policies about masking for in-person learning or ventilation and spacing? Um, because the reality is that no matter how good we make online or hybrid, it's not gonna match the quality of in-person learning. Um, second, I think we need good measurement. Um, we need to figure out what are the metrics that we care about and establish plans to measure them, both now um, to establish a baseline and also over time to track our progress in, in addressing them. And this could mean anything from state tests to local interim or benchmark tests, measures of student and teacher well being, mental health, et cetera. Uh, the truth is that we can't know what we need to address without good measurement, and we can't track whether we're doing the right things without ongoing measurement. And third, I think we need quality curriculum um, that can reduce the burden on teachers, that can engage students, and that rec can represent the diversity in student cultures and experiences. And importantly, we, we also need something that can be used in a, a remote or hybrid situation, which we hope will not happen, but it may. And we don't want to force everyone to go back to curriculum by teachers pay teachers. So in all of these areas, my most important point is that the state must leverage its resources to ensure these things happen. The state must encourage or compel schools to be open as much as possible and must support efforts to address school hesitancy. The state should support good measurement by selecting or recommending one or more measures or tools that can be applied consistently statewide. And the state should recommend or require high quality materials and support their quality implementation as other states have done. It's a, a really bad idea to leave these issues up to individual district leaders um, that just increases the burden on already overwhelmed educators and all but guarantees a widening of educational inequality across California's thousand plus school districts. Thank you for that, Morgan. And today we have uh, three superintendents who are already on the front lines uh, trying to make these tough decisions. Um, and why don't we start with Roxanne Fuentes from Berryessa. 
Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for allowing me to be part of this conversation. Uh, just to share a little bit about Berryessa Union, we're located in the city of San Jose, the heart of Silicon Valley. Uh, we service about 6,500 students, TK through eighth grade. Uh, we have a highly diverse community um, for 6,500, uh, over 50 languages spoken. About a third of our students are English learners, and a third of our students qualify for free and reduced lunch. Uh, navigating the pandemic has been quite challenging. Uh, Berryessa does straddle between North and East San Jose. East San Jose has been one of the hardest hit communities with COVID-19 in uh, Santa Clara County. So there has been high uh, hesitancy with our community, both families and staff, to return to in-person. So we've had to uh, really think strategically on how we balanced our, our funds that we've been receiving receiving to support our efforts, both in dealing with uh, physical safety and emotional safety. Uh, you know, we were um, fortunate that prior to the pandemic, our board had established mental health and well-being as one of our strategic goals. So we had already invested in having uh, school site based social workers across our, our district, which was a tremendous support when uh, the pandemic uh, challenges first began. But as you know, uh, in Silicon Valley, with the cost of living, um, our most vulnerable families are facing even more challenges now. Uh, we have many children living in multifamily home situations, and it's been very, very difficult. Uh, so we've had to um, invest our early dollars in meeting immediate needs, uh, making sure that meal service was continuous, connectivity was available for distance learning, and broadening our mental health supports and outreach. And so in doing so, we know now moving forward uh, that even in our system with the best of intentions, there were gaps and there continue to be. And so we're trying to rethink critically, what can we do to re-engage our students? We were fortunate that this week is our first week of welcoming our children back. And it is the right thing. And seeing their smiling eyes, everyone knows it is what's best for them. But again, we still have 60% of our families that have chosen to remain in distance learning until June. And so we're wanting to continue to build uh, confidence amongst our community that returning to school is a safe thing to do, that it is the right thing to do, and thinking about how we can maximize these one-time dollars for a long-term impact. For Berryessa, uh, we're gonna be receiving about $2,000 per student based on our demographics. So there's a wide range of funding allocations that are being given district to district. And so right now, as we think through how we want to invest those dollars, we are looking at equity work we had already started and looking at trauma-informed practices and professional learning for our staff to help that re-engagement um, of everyone within our system as we begin to reopen our schools and think differently on how we can personalize what we do. Thank you for that. Uh, let me turn to uh, Darren Brawley from Compton. Um, what, do, what do you see there as in the way of challenges and opportunities? <laughs> you know, we, we have addressed a lot of issues associated with the pandemic. And um, we began by addressing the academic and social emotional learning and social fluency gaps associated with our students. We relied upon our focus on PBIS as a building blocks for student academic and social emotional success. And using PBIS as the uh, foundation, we implemented social fluency, many lessons, highlighting the Boys Towns Press top 18 social fluency skills, incorporating the Cassell framework, and using Second Step as an SEL curriculum. Uh, how have we addressed social emotional learning through this funding? Through a belief that SEL can be a powerful lever for creating caring, inclusive, and healthy communities that support all individuals in reaching their fullest potential. For this reason, our CWA department uh, continued to provide much needed interventions for parents and students. This included mental health, social emotional learning supports through our partners and their telehealth virtual platforms, our mental health practitioners, and our wellness centers. Our school sites have received professional development focused specifically on social emotional intervention and supports. Second step was piloted, as I said, 
later adopted. In surveying our parents, our, our staff for 70% of them and 74% of our parents surveyed last year indicated that the schools provided social emotional support for student wellness, such as counseling, crisis intervention, social fluency lessons, growth mindset training, character education, and PBIS. How are we planning to spend resources? A major component will involve the replacement of our HVAC systems to comply and address airflow and recirculation within our classrooms. We anticipate that we will spend approximately 58 million of the $195 million that we will receive on that purpose. We're addressing student learning loss through extended learning opportunities. We're providing students with a robust Saturday school program, as well as a robust summer school. Summer school will be focused on student learning loss, credit recovery, and acceleration of students to enable them to explore more opportunities related to college and career. How do we use uh, the funding to enhance virtual learning? We provided after hour supports for students and parents. Uh, we have a ro robust professional development uh, plan in place that has assisted our students in delivering virtual instruction. Also a robust distance learning platform with weekly lessons uh, planned for the entire school year. We have academic interventions before, during school, Saturday school, et cetera. We also use college tutors as in-class support uh, for the students that are, are struggling. And we also provide students with online tutoring through, uh, through an agency known as, as PAPER, 24-hour online live tutoring and support. And as far as partners in the area of mental health, we have quite a few, uh, and some of them are as follows, Bayfront, uh, Mental Health Services, Centinella Youth Services, uh, Children's and Families, Tessie Cleveland, Charles Drew, Shields for Family, uh, Department of Mental Health, Care Solace, Homebound, and, and those are just some of the things that we've done to name a few. Thank you very much, Superintendent. And finally, um, Sandra Lyon uh, from Palm Springs. Palm Springs not always thought of as an area with a lot of challenges. What are you seeing there? Um, Superintendent. Thank you, Dr. McGarry, and uh, thank you for having me as part of this panel. It's an important topic, and I'm glad we're having this conversation. You're right. People think of Palm Springs, and they think of the resorts and the vacation homes, and in reality, um, our numbers of students in need has gone up during this past year um, from about 92 to 93 percent low income to 97 percent, which is often very surprising to folks. Um, we have about 80% of our students are um, Latinx and about 30% of our students are English learners. Um, so we also, like my colleague um, Roxanne have, has talked about, have parents and families who are reluctant to return to school. So we have really worked on building the safety uh, plan. When we surveyed our parents in the fall, the biggest concern that they had was the safety of returning to campuses. We have, like uh, Superintendent Brawley mentioned, purchased uh, the air cleaners. We have upgraded our filtration systems, PPE, testing on an ongoing basis. So a lot of, um, not a lot of those resources, but a significant amount of those resources have gone toward that. Additionally, um, we were a one-to-one -one district, so we were in a better position than a number of districts that um, started out without that ability. So we created tech depots. We purchased a, a tremendous amount of technology, both for our staff in the classrooms, for the staff working at home, and then as well for our students. We have um, distributed over 10,000 hotspots to students who didn't have good wireless access. And I know that's one of the things that Superintendent Thurmond has talked about throughout this pandemic is um, how it's laid bare the actual uh, disparity in ability to access Wi-Fi and even to access a virtual online program. So we spent a great deal of time for that. We continue to provide tech depots so that our families, if they're having any technical trouble, can bring in the device that's not working or get a new hotspot. And so that continues to be something that we're building out. Um, in terms of social, emotional learning and health supports, um, as we bring students back, and this is our second week of having students on campus, and, um, and let me just backtrack for a minute, we've gone a little bit more slowly in returning students to campus. Like Superintendent Fuentes, about 38 to 40 percent of our um, families wanted to stay in distance learning and the others to come back. It's been slightly lower than those who thought initially they would come back, have come back. Um, but what we know and what we're seeing is that wellness overall for our students is a top priority. 
uh, for our families in surveys, for our teachers just in the initial encounters with students and for our students overall during this time that students have been at home. Uh, chronic absenteeism, which we know has many different factors involved, was a problem in our district before the pandemic and, as you can imagine, has been a critical piece throughout the pandemic and something that we're going to continue to work on. So we've deployed a number of uh, faculty and staff to go to campus, to go to houses, to uh, create hub learning hubs throughout this time, even in virtual learning, where students who lack connectivity, who didn't have a supervision at home or a safe place to work, could come in and access their virtual programming. Um, we do have a, a robust mental health department. We're very fortunate to have had that prior to the pandemic. So we have had a, a fairly um, widespread um, ability for students to access counselors at a variety of times during the day and in the evening. And we've needed to increase that. And so we've uh, increased social emotional learning programming. We've worked with teachers to develop all kinds of um, strategies and supports for students working through the tiers so that our students' mental health is um, taken care of. We do know from our families that is a primary concern. Um, when I meet with families, we really talk a lot the last thing I want to say is just a couple of points uh, around what I've heard from our colleagues and from um, our, the professors at the university level, and that is this is one time funding. We keep talking about transforming education with one time dollars, and I just don't see how that gets done as a practitioner. So I'm really eager to hear how we bring all the stakeholders to the table and, and build on some of the concepts that Dr. Marsh is talking about, because it has to be board members, superintendents, legislators, parents, families, university professors, teacher training programs, credential programs. There are so many facets of this to really truly change what we do and improve upon it over time. Um, and so I could go on and on, but I'll leave it there and hopefully can answer more during some questions. Thank you for that. Uh, so let me pose a few questions first to the, the faculty panel and then back to the superintendents. Um, and, and the first I want to pose relates to this issue of hesitancy, which several have brought up. Uh, we know that reopening school is not like turning on a faucet and suddenly everybody appears. There are teachers who are afraid, there are families that are afraid, and we know that despite the fact that the evidence shows that kids should be in school, uh, many of the families that have been most hard hit are the most reluctant. Uh, what do you think districts could do to build trust and address the fear that's out there? Well, I'll, so I'll give one answer um, or uh, I guess maybe a few thoughts. Um, so there's been, actually been some really recent research on uh, what's driving school hesitancy. Um, and, and, and it's, as you would expect, a confluence of factors um, that has to do with, as you say, the people's experiences during the pandemic um, and often how those have been felt unequally across racial and class lines. Um, but also has to do with actually just school reopening policies and that the mere fact of being open and being in us and, and seeing how educators are taking it seriously and, uh, and, and seeing that uh, most of the time there are, uh, you know, when precautions are taken, there are not outbreaks um, can actually have remarkable effects on people's hesitancy. Um, and, uh, you know, a, a personal example, um, at, you know, I live in Los Angeles where schools have been closed the in, entire year for in-person learning. My mother-in-law teaches in Texas and she has been in a classroom in person the entire year. And there have been no outbreaks in her school and they have good attendance that's gone up over the course of the year. So, so I, I think the mere act of being open and, and of, of demonstrating that you care about everyone's well-being through taking appropriate precautions like policies related to masking can really go a long way. I haven't thought about it as much, I think, as Morgan. I would just add that I've noticed in the research I've done in schools where I think we're giving teachers options and voice and feeling empowered has helped in sort of alleviating some of that fear. I think the more that you feel that you are uh, able to make the choices that fit you well, I think will have a, have a very positive impact on some of the adult fear and trust issues. Um, I think the more we get vaccinated, I think that's also going to play a role with the with the teachers. I mean, I think as a parent, I think I think we have to allow our families to still stay at home if they want to stay home. I, I actually don't feel that we need to be forcing people right now, given the trauma that they've been in and the situations that they're in. Um, and for a lot of families right now, actually getting their children to school and you know, there's lots of complications involved. So I, I tend to try and think more out to next year and what we're going to do this summer and 
um, at the moment, I, I'm sort of, I'm okay with, I would like to get everyone back, but I don't know if we're gonna actually be able to build the trust and, and address some of these bigger issues in the, in the short run. <laughs> Our experience, okay. Our experience has been that the schools themselves now need to develop a real outreach plan and they need to make sure they're devoting some resources to that outreach. In part, this is a social marketing problem. It really has to be laid out to families what's good, what's new, what's promising, how they're going to handle certain things. And th that information has to flow pretty naturally and, and come through the community members. The community members have to be a real stakeholder in all this, or otherwise we're not, not going to really get the type of support that we need to encourage all kids. As kids start to come back, they need to be brought into the communities through social media and social networking so that they're really being part of the invitation back to school. Let me uh, bring the superintendents back. Uh, all three of you are in districts with large numbers of um, non-English speaking families. Uh, there was a study just released today showing that families that don't speak English have had higher death rates uh, than those that do um, and are even more reluctant about coming back. What kind of special outreach are you doing to our uh, families of, of, that are not English fluent and uh, often cut off from traditional avenues of information? I, I'll, I'll go first. We consistently survey our parents around, around the issue of uh, returning back to school. And we make sure that that survey is, is done in Spanish for Spanish speaking parents. We also host uh, community forums with parents uh, to get their input. And for whatever reason, um, we have not been able to quite turn that corner related to the percentage of individuals that are interested in returning. I think there's a, a huge amount of fear out there still around COVID. A lot of families within our community have been impacted. Me personally, my, my sister's husband died of, of COVID. And so initially it was, oh, this is happening to everybody else, but not me. And as time went on, you know, you, you're hard pressed to find anyone that has not been impacted and does not know someone that lost their life uh, related to COVID. So there's still this immense amount of fear out there. And I think it's gonna take uh, a lot of different approaches on our part. Um, you know, having a very articulated uh, vaccination process in place. You know, now that our 16 and, and, and over students can be vaccinated and very soon our 12 and over likely to receive the uh, okay to be vaccinated. So we're gonna have to have a very robust uh, campaign around those issues. We've done a lot uh, with our teachers. We've partnered with St. John's. We have our own vaccination clinic at Clinton Elementary School uh, within our district where we're vaccinating whomever wants to be vaccinated within the community as well as uh, teachers and, and employees within our organization. But fear is something that we have to figure out how we overcome that component that is keeping people back from returning. Yeah, I'd also like to add, um, you know, certainly how we communicate to our community has definitely evolved through this pandemic. Our outreach has been quite extensive, uh, town halls, focus groups, phone calls, home visits. Uh, myself as superintendent, I do uh, every other week video messaging. And as we prepared for return, we did a full video for school return so that everyone could see the safety mitigation measures that were put in place into the classroom um, to just, again, to continue to build comfort, even for our own staff who many had not returned to the classroom since last March. And although they may have heard that the district was making investments in all of these different safety measures, they hadn't seen it. You know, they, they weren't familiar with what the cleaning practices were that we were implementing. So video messaging has been a very powerful tool. Um, in Berryessa, uh, you know, our three uh, 
dominant languages besides English is Mandarin, Vietnamese, and Spanish. And uh, we have our in-house interpreters who uh, these three women are amazing and they've been essential in um, doing personal outreach to our families uh, when uh, they don't respond to surveys, uh, you know, when they're struggling uh, with the handbooks and the guides that we're providing to parents. They make those personal phone calls to get the, to make that connection and to be more of a have a more personalized approach. It's not easy. It's time intensive, um, but that's been one way that we've been able to try to provide some assurances of, of what we're currently doing to make schools safe for everyone. Uh, you know, we've been doing the same things as both of the other superintendents. And um, I think there are sort of two issues. One is uh, the concerns around health, the trust of, of uh, is my child going to be safe? Are we going to be safe? And I think, you know, the idea of how this um, pandemic has hit different communities is really important for people who are pushing for students to get back to school to understand. In our community, we have many multi-generational households who live together. Our family members are often those who are working in grocery stores, they're working in the hospitals, they're working in assisted uh, living centers. And so they are exposed, they're in those congregate settings. And so there's been a real concern overall about their exposure to the virus. Um, we've been um, really working hard to show those families what we're gonna be able to do. But I think as vaccinations um, become more prevalent, people feel more confident about that, that's going to help. But um, to Superintendent Brawley's point, we've lost staff members, we have students who've lost parents, grandparents, uh, aunts and uncles. Uh, the, you know, the stress and the um, traumatic impact on our families is not to be understated. I also do think if we had been able to come back initially five days a week, with a regular schedule, we would have had a better opportunity to bring students back. Um, the hybrid schedule, is there is no good hybrid schedule. That is a true statement. It is a challenge um, to balance uh, keeping a teacher, if that's a teacher you've had all year and that's your desire, and be able to have that teacher in front of students delivering instruction in person, as well as creating that instructional piece over um, the internet in that virtual setting. So uh, how school districts decided to come about their return to sc uh, school based on their county levels and what was happening with their articulation with County Department of Public Health really made a difference, I think, in what we were able to offer. I'm really optimistic, though, and I just want to say this, that going forward in the fall, we'll have very different numbers, providing that we're able to stay in a good space with the spread of the virus and the vaccination rates continue to go up. Um, and I think that's really what we need to continue to focus our energy on and continue to outreach. We're doing the same thing. Everything's in Spanish now. We live stream our board meetings in Spanish. Our town halls have been in Spanish and we are doing all of the high touch things that we can do, phone calls, home visits, all the support pieces to try to get people back into our system. And we, and we hear from our families. So we know they appreciate, appreciate the outreach and they have a lot of reservations. Thank you. Uh, I'll pose one more question and then we'll take start taking questions from our audience. Um, you know, we've rarely been in a situation where we've had almost all the resources we need in terms of funding. Uh, but we know that with that comes a great expectation that we'll use those funds well. And several of our speakers today have, have, have laid out, you know, how they think they'll use it. Um, what are your concerns about, aside from the fact that it's one time, about the use of public funds and, 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 and how we sustain programs that, that are clearly working. Several of you talked about the need for more guidance from the state, uh, either Julia or Morgan. Do you wanna elaborate further on that? Yeah, I mean, I'll just make a small point, and I think maybe folks in the in the audience watching this are probably wondering, you know, I've talked to lots of folks in the district offices, and there's lots of technical issues around what are the allowable expenses, and I think for a lot of folks that's a, an issue that they'd like to get some clarity on. I know lots of folks have spent hours and hours, worked with lawyers to figure out what does it mean for expenses to be substantially different, or what does it mean to have evidence-based practices, so I think folks in the in, you know, concerned around students with disabilities have been looking for guidance, both from the state and the federal government. And, you know, so I have some concerns about the amount of time people might be spending and trying to account for the dollars and what they can use it for and what they can't. And I think that calls on, you know, I think it calls on CDE and the federal government and others to maybe give some more guidance on that. Um, so that would be one sort of technical thing uh, around it. 
I think some of the issues around this kind of one time funds, I think we really need to think about not just hiring sort of short term contracts and what happens then when those people are, you know, having to be laid off. And I think a lot of the superintendents already are doing lots of important things with their investments and thinking about ways to invest in ways that can make these investments sustain themselves. So whether that's thinking about training and support, um, for me, to me, that's sort of crucial around thinking about how do we support the adults and the teachers and the principals. Um, and in that training is, is a long-term investment built into that because hopefully we will retain those people as long as we support them in their positions. And I guess I just want to make one more point. I don't know, I'm sort of going off track a bit, but we talk a lot about the social emotional needs of kids. And I just really want to make sure we're focusing on the adults. I'd like to talk about the trauma and the compassion fatigue of our adults in our schools. So to me, we're going to have to really worry long-term about retaining these folks. We already know that people are leaving the profession. We already know that we're hearing principals are deciding they might wanna leave sooner. We already know that superintendents, as we have found out in our news just this past day uh, in LA Unified, uh, we need to think about investing in our adults in the buildings in order for them to be able to help our students. And so I think we need to get creative in thinking about wellness checks for our adults, um, ways that we can support the social, emotional, and, and mental health of all of the adults in our building, supporting them, giving them stipends, giving them time, all of the things that we need to do. They're the linchpins for us. I think they have the hardest jobs right now that any of us could imagine right now. So I think that's where I would put my money. I don't, I don't have too much to add to what Julie said. I think that was terrific. But I, you know, I, I just want to echo, you know, clear guidance and uh, recommendations. The more that the state can do to make it easy on uh, local educators to figure out how to use the money um, and you know, uh, just take those kinds of decisions off their plates, I think the better. Um, we're just, uh, you know, at, right after this, I'm teaching a class of K-12 educators and I've been teaching them all semester and Oof, it's getting rough towards the end of the semester. I mean, we're just, they're just really struggling. Um, and uh, so, the, you know, they just need, they just need clear guidance and support. I would echo much of what they said. I think the one thing I hope will happen, and if there's going to be more guidance, should go in that direction, is to really have people from the start talk about how they're going to sustain the type of changes they're doing. If they're going to talk about mental health issues, how will they sustain something beyond the short-term funding? We know there will be people brought on temporarily and left off. We know a couple of initiatives will be put in and will disappear when the money goes. Rather than starting with that as the premise and understanding that like a Greek tragedy, let's start thinking about what we can do to really put something in place that will be sustainable and perhaps a different way of going about trying to deal with some of these very complicated problems, which have been around long before COVID and are gonna be with us for some time to come. I really encourage people to start thinking about not just mental health alone, but how mental health really gets embedded in what's going on in schools in a significant way and how it gets broadened to understand that kids have multifaceted problems. A kid who has mental health concerns is also probably not doing well with learning in school, maybe a behavior problem in school. Those have to be put together and we need to think more broadly about what are we putting in place that's really going to deal with those things and help the families deal with those things better. Uh, just the other thing I would come back to the point we were making before, and that is, it's really going to be important in terms of the outreach to start bringing in the families and kids who are already back. And it, they become an organizational force if we will use them in order to really reach out to their neighbors much better than most of us can do. Thank you for that. So I'm glad you raised that last point about behavioral issues, because uh, one of the things we know is that um, suspension rates have been way down during the pandemic <laughs> because kids aren't in school. Um, and, and as Howard just said, there, there may be kids because of having been isolated for so long, when they come back, um, may not exactly be ready to be the most compliant. Uh, this is an opportunity, I think, to try to start to approach how we address behavior differently. And I don't just, 
do any of the superintendents have thoughts on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll start off with that. Um, I, I think it's important uh, that there's a, a clear, clearly articulated process for discipline. Uh, when I first arrived in Compton, we had uh, significant issues associated with expulsion and suspension. And, you know, as the years progressed, I think after the second year here, we reduced our expulsions significantly, no more than maybe one, one to three a year. In terms of uh, suspensions, suspensions have, have gone away significantly uh, within our organization and almost all of our schools are in pretty good standing related to the dashboard related to suspensions. The other thing I think it's important for folks to understand, you know, a lot of suspensions occur with students of disabilities. And oftentimes uh, people are overlooking the, you know, the, the condition that manifests that causes the suspension, which is related to why they're placed in, in special education to begin with. So if you understand that a student has issues with certain behaviors, why are you suspending them for those behaviors? They're in the program for you to assist them related to those qualifying conditions. So I think there has to be better communication, uh, articulation between administration and teachers, and everyone has to have a, a, a better understanding in terms of how they proceed uh, with disciplinary measures. I mean, you're, you're trying to eliminate the behavior, not punish the behavior. I'll just jump in. I, I agree with that. And I think um, it is, you know, like so much in education, the brain loves a pattern and we have a pattern for what school discipline looks like. And it's very hard to push people into new directions around that. Um, one of the things that we're doing that's work that's grown out of our anti-racism coalition is to really work with all of our um, safety officers to make sure that they have um, anti you know, bias training, unconscious bias training, that they are prepared to have different strategies for helping students de-escalate and, and self-regulate. Um, and it is, it's a big lift. And I think um, the idea that on a dime, we can turn how people think about controlling student behavior, especially when we do have external, you know, not in the classroom folks, is safety officers and whatnot, that the community really wants. That's one of the top priorities in our LCAP every year is more safety officers, more security. Um, and so to Darren's point, it really has to be about how we're helping our teachers, providing the professional learning, providing the supports, and having enough ongoing staffing to make sure that we're working with students to eliminate those behaviors and not let them escalate. I've been doing this work for you know, a long time, and, um, and I can tell you that's a conversation that's been in every decade that I've worked. And so we've moved the dial, but not enough. And we need to continue to make sure that people we're bringing into the classrooms and onto our campuses understand that our goal is to help students be able to self-monitor, self-regulate, and not escalate to a position where we're in that sort of disciplinary situation. I will also add that um, you know, with us in our district, um, one of the things we're talking about is as students come back on, is the ability of students to interact with each other and to have appropriate behaviors in the classrooms. And so we're really doing a lot of work to prep students and to provide opportunities for them to connect with each other. Some of our students have been isolated for a very long time. And it's one of the questions that we have is when we get full numbers back on campuses, um, what's that gonna be like for some of our students who haven't had to comport to a classroom uh, in the traditional way that we would expect? Sam, you, yes, you it? thank you. Yes, I would agree with uh, both my colleagues. And one thing that I will say too, um, because you know, as we work on MTSS and build our multi-tiered system of supports, you know, we're looking at all these different strategies on how we can shift our thinking on student discipline. But I will say that in the pandemic, uh, through Zoom, many of our teachers finally saw some of their students realities, you know, as they saw them in cam on the camera uh, in multifamily settings, uh, sometimes, you know, uh, not in the best situation uh, to be engaged in learning. And it provided, you know, some sensitivity maybe uh, that wasn't there, some knowledge that wasn't there on why it is that we're spending time on shifting our teaching. We've been doing work with the National Equity Project uh, focused on 
culturally responsive teaching practices uh, to, to make that mind shift, which uh, you know is something that we talk about all the time. And now with the added layer of the pandemic challenges uh, going into this summer's professional learning, we're adding on our work with uh, mindful uh, with the mindful leaders project. Uh, I know Dr. Marsh mentioned about our adults and you know their own self care and understanding why we perceive um, student behavior the way we do, what's triggering us neurologically to react the way that we do. And that's the work that we'll be pursuing this summer over the course of the next three year cycle on um, how our brain functions and how we react to student behavior and why we why certain behaviors trigger reactions on the adults in the system so that we can better improve our responses and meet the needs of our students more effectively. So that's just one avenue that we're beginning to explore. So one of the questions we got has to do with how we share what we're learning uh, during this. Um, some of you are gonna discover some strategies that work very well in your community. How do we make sure it's not limited to your community? Um, how do we make sure that good news travels and is available to districts, whether they're urban, rural, suburban, throughout the state? Any thoughts on that? I think the uh, best way for that is to, is to have your professional learning communities, uh, you know, your, your groups uh, related to the professional groups that you participate in. I can, uh, you know, I can honestly say that we have a group in Los Angeles County uh, with the re within the region that I'm in where about eight of us come together constantly to address issues associated with the pandemic and how we are planning on uh, handling this issue or proceeding with this, you know, whether we're talking about uh, in-person graduations or, or something else of, of, of a different nature. We're constantly bouncing those ideas off of each other, learning from each other in terms of the approach that uh, one might be taking, which provides feedback to someone else to, you know, address theirs a little differently and, and change course to adjust based upon what they've heard. So I think more of that has to happen. Uh, in Los Angeles County, um, we have a, a weekly meeting every Thursday with Dr. Ferrer and Dr. Gilchek, and where we're able to post the questions uh, and concerns related to uh, guidance that has come out or anything that is impacting uh, school districts from the state level or the county level. And so that's, that's been a very, very uh, productive forum for superintendents within Los Angeles County. Anyone else? Um, how do we share good ideas? I know, Howard, you're a sharing machine over there uh, at UCLA. Um, how do we get good information out there to other superintendents? Well, <clears throat> We've established for some time a community of practice that really brings folks together from across the country. There's about 120,000 people now on our listserv, and we continuously try to elicit from people good ideas and get them back up. So community practice has been important, but we also try to send out on a regular basis to anybody who's there who will share stuff and then get them in front of people and get some reactions to that and get some dialogue going on with that. But it just seems important for all of us to figure out that we can communicate and share, but there has to be some people facilitating that process in a good way. But I think what's clear is that what Darren said is the local pulling together is probably the most powerful because then they're really starting to talk what's relevant to their neighborhood and their uh, particular community. But I think there is some value in just sharing more broadly. Roxanne, were you going to jump in before I cut you off? No problem. I was just going to echo uh, what Darren had shared. I think our professional networks are critical. You know, here in Santa Clara County, our Office of Education, as well as our Public Health Department, has hosted meetings for us every Tuesday uh, throughout this entire phase, which has been, you know, uh, critical for us to get right time information. 
but really it's what the conversations that happen after the meetings when the superintendents stay on and we're processing everything that we've learned to be able to share what it's looking like in our districts and what's working and you know and what continue to be challenges in addition to that you know santa clara county is very um, diverse in the types of districts and communities that we serve and berryessa being on the east side we have our own east side alliance and one thing i would encourage others to do is we have a seven feeder elementary districts into our high school district east side union uh, school district and uh, we meet uh, on a monthly basis we have a constant text of communication on how we're trying to support our families and it's a really nice uh, partnership uh, with my colleagues um, to you know understand you know our families uh, challenges and how we can best support our students um, through those conversations do you want to go ahead julie I just, I was gonna add a couple of thoughts. I love all these ideas. I'm thinking about the role of the media and I'm thinking of places like EdSource that does a nice job. And, you know, is there more that we could think about as the role of the media to share, not just the, the trauma and the negative, but the positive things going on all over. And I think EdSource has done some of that really nicely. What about places like the California Collaborative for Educational Excellence and the role of the state in trying to promote some of this? And then I'm also thinking about associations and I'm thinking about AXA and I know AXA has networks of resources um, on their websites and various places. So I'm just trying to think of also how can we create some of these networks that don't already exist, not just for superintendents, but I'm also thinking for principals and, and other leaders in schools. Thank you, Sandra. Yeah, Julie, just plugged the two that I was gonna plug. Um, the California Collaborative for Educational Excellence, which is part of the system of support, has amazing resources. If you haven't been to the website, I highly encourage it. Um, Dr. Naguer is there as a keynote in some of the professional learning, Michael Fullen, Doug Reeves, but there's also playbooks, really um, resources that administrators, both at the site and the district level can pull down that really address things that are happening right now in real time in their classrooms. So I really encourage that. AXA is another um, great source of information and for administrators to access. But I really encourage what um, both Superintendent Brawley and Fuentes said, and that is creating your own network of uh, folks who are experiencing some of the things that you're experiencing, as well as folks who are in very different contexts. Uh, for me, as a network, that really makes a difference because sometimes we get into a bubble within our own area, and it's helpful to have that cross-county kind of interaction as well. So whatever networks you can create that allow you to pick the brains of superintendents or principals in other areas is really helpful. So let me ask a slightly different question um, related to trauma too. Uh, and that is relating to the police killings that have occurred and, and the trial recently of Derek Chauvin. Um, we know that millions of people across the world, including many children, witnessed the murder of George Floyd on, on film. And we also know that that's not the only incident, that there have been many, many others since then. Uh, as kids return to school, what should teachers be doing to prepare them uh, or at least help kids address this kind of trauma related to this, these, these issues of racial injustice, particularly involving the police? Well, that's a very difficult question that I don't have a good answer to, but I will say that certainly some of the answer lies in supporting teachers to do that work, which I think we have some evidence that, that they haven't been so far. So a, a different project that I worked on was a, a survey of teachers back in November with Educators for Excellence for Los Angeles area teachers. And we asked them about um, both whether they had done any teaching on these issues and also whether they had received any support on them. And the answer was uh, not particularly much and not particularly much. Um, so I think once again, like you, you can't just layer on another expectation for teachers that you're going to go out there and, and deliver a, a you know, a, 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 or a support teachers and, and support students in getting through this very difficult issue without get, giving some really clear guidance and supports for how they're supposed to do that. Um, and, and, you know, first of all, it creates a huge burden on teachers. And second of all, a lot of teachers just aren't well, aren't well prepared to be doing that. Um, and so you might end up with things that are really problematic. Um, at, at minimum. I think it's an excellent opportunity for us to examine uh, whether or not something 
and, and I shouldn't say whether or not something should be included, because it should be included in our social science framework, right? So it's an excellent opportunity for us to uh, adjust in that area. Uh, I do know that Los Angeles County Office of Education is, is, is currently in the process of sending out materials for uh, school districts within Los Angeles County to address that issue with their students. But I think first and foremost, this gives us an opportunity to literally rewrite history as it pertains to how individuals of color have been treated within the country and to address it in, in an educational setting. Anyone else yeah, I would just add that I think that these funds are a great opportunity for us to invest in creating better materials around um, these, these issues and, and issues about racial equity and racism. And then I think it also, as others have said, really needs to be invested in, in helping teachers and others understand how to actually go about teaching that. Um, it, so it's, those are two separate important uh, investments that we need to be making. Um, on this front. And I think it's an opportunity for us with this funds that have come down to be doing that. And it sounds like from what we've heard today, some of the superintendents on this panel are already um, doing that, you know, and I, and I applaud them for the things they've already told us about their anti-racist work and the mindfulness, mindful leaders program that I heard being said by Superintendent Fuentes. Um, I think all of these are, are good, you know, in the, in the right direction and we should be investing and in doing more in that area. Okay, I have one last question, it seems. Um, what about high school seniors who, who, because they've been doing remote learning, may be at a real disadvantage in the college application process and um, maybe less prepared? Are there any things that we could be doing differently and to improve support for those students? You know, it's, it's interesting. Um, and I don't know if it's the same experience for anyone else, but we're, we're having some of the best admission rates that we've ever had. And I think part of that has to do with the elimination of the SAT. And so now they're focused on the GPA and other accomplishments the students have achieved. So I think it's, it's just, it's just going to take us a lot of reimagining what the most important uh, components are in terms of college admission. Uh, we used to focus a lot on SAT, uh, SAT scores. Well, we don't have to focus on that so much anymore. Now we can focus on other components such as GPA and things like that. So we, we've had a better year thus, thus far, not a, a bad year uh, as it pertains to the pandemic. So I can't really come up with any suggestions around that based upon what what's coming in, you know, the admission rates for Dominguez into UCLA are higher than they've ever been. It's the highest year we've ever had, significant, significantly higher. All right, I wanna, um, we only have a few minutes left. So I wanna allow the state superintendent to come back uh, to also offer any final thoughts about what you've heard today. Um, we have lots of other educators out there, not just in California, around the country listening in thinking about these issues. Um, Tony, what would you say as parting thoughts about this work that lies ahead? You know, first I would just like to really commend the incredible uh, leadership uh, that we heard represented today uh, by Superintendents Fuentes and Lyons um, and Brawley. Um, you know, uh, we live in an environment where people just point the finger and wanna blame. Uh, at a time when we are experiencing something that there's no clear playbook to deal with. And I have to tell you, I could not keep up with my note taking and listening to the things that the superintendents were sharing um, about how they are trying to address issues around race, how they are trying to uh, help our families to feel safe and comfortable to return. And I wanna thank all of our friends in higher ed too uh, for uh, all the wonderful things, uh, uh, you know, Dr. Marsh and Dr. Edelman and, uh, and, and uh, Dr. Polakoff, all the things that were shared today really do give us great examples on how to move forward. Uh, you know, I would, I sort of was saying, yeah, 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 everything that the soups were saying, because we were working on some of those things. The one thing I would offer, you know, I do think it's a real concern that families uh, are worried about coming back. Um, we have seen this since the middle of the pandemic, research talking about uh, families and particular families of color not wanting to 
chance it, so to speak. And I think a lot of that is because of the disproportionate health impacts that African-American families, Latino families and others have experienced where they know someone who's died from the pandemic. And so, you know, I thought all the things that were shared today about ventilation and air filtration um, and vaccines were so right on point. I, I would just add that there are some other resources that may help. Um, there are these rapid COVID tests and we've worked with the governor's office and we've secured 5 million free rapid COVID tests by Binax that can allow uh, for anyone to have awareness about someone who comes to the school and is asymptomatic and positive for COVID. That's so important so that someone can quarantine and the rest of the school community can remain safe. I agree. I think it was Dr. Morgan Polakoff who said that we just have to see it to believe it. Um, and then more families will be comfortable with the idea of coming. So we just want people to know that we do have access to the rapid COVID test and the California Department of Education would like to help in making those available to any school that, that wants to use it. Um, I wanted to say, um, uh, Dr. Marshall, we hear you. Uh, uh, where more guidance can be used to, on how to spend these dollars and what are allowable expenses. And uh, we will work with districts to provide more information where we can. And if we don't get to you fast enough, please reach out to us. We, we typically are working through different networks like AXA and the county superintendents, but we wanna hear from those who have questions. And yes, um, more guidance on special education. I believe that was one of the items that you flagged. And, and Dr. Naguera, I appreciate you raising um, the issues around race. We've talked about all of our interventions um, to the pandemic, uh, but I think um, this is also a moment where we're experiencing the pandemic of racism. And uh, our students have watched um, as these acts of hate have increased dramatically, uh, certainly um, perhaps climaxing with the killing of George Floyd and the incredible surge, sadly, of uh, hate acts against our Asian American Pacific Islander communities. And it's not limited to those communities that we know our immigrant communities have been impacted. We know that so many, and we are all interconnected. Uh, uh, we, you know, Our students have really led the way here and they've told us they want more ethnic studies. They wanna see people who look like them in their textbooks. And we've had a great ethnic studies series. Uh, we've worked with the State Board of Education to provide school districts with a resource guide on how schools can bring ethnic studies to their schools. The legislature is considering a requirement uh, to make ethnic studies a graduation requirement. That's uh, AB 101. Um, at the same time, we've been able to raise money from foundations to get grants to school districts. They need resources, as all of your panelists have said today, to do direct training, on anti-racism training, addressing implicit bias. We created a whole new series called Education to End Hate. And we've been able to help some districts, but we received interest letters from more than 400 districts. And so clearly we need more resources. We for one are going back to the state to say, let's provide more resources and guidance on how to do this work around anti-racism. I guess my final thought would be Dr. Naguera that uh, what I witnessed here today is exactly what I think you and I have talked about. Um, the benefits between our, our leaders in higher education and K-12 education working together. There's no easy answers to what we face, uh, but I am confident uh, that with the wisdom and experience that we heard today, um, uh, we can get there and we can get there together. And I'm hopeful that we can connect again with all the panelists. Uh, I've had the good fortune of working with Superintendent Brawley, uh, who serves on our statewide Superintendent's Advisory Council. Um, you know, uh, Superintendent Fuentes and Lyons, I've seen your work um, and admire it. Uh, you know, I'd like to get together with this group again and continue this series of higher ed partners and K-12 partners working together to help us keep everyone safe. Thank you for today's convening and looking forward to our ongoing work for our 6 million students. Thank you, Superintendent Thurman, and uh, appreciate your willingness to work with us in putting this event and getting information to the hands of the public, particularly our superintendents out there. So I wanna thank all of you today for joining in. Um, as, as the superintendent said, there are no easy answers to these complex issues, but we are at a moment where there are, are public resources available to solve and to address some of these problems. So our hope is the article won't be written that the money was wasted. Instead, the article will be written that we use this as an opportunity to have a tremendous impact to benefit children throughout our state and throughout the country. So thank you all for joining us today and we wish you all the very best.